Yeah, I still hear the stray slap. I'm hoping that's on the hand, right? That's a high five. So, hey, uh, children. Yeah, thank you for that, Juan Ramos. Children, you can be dismissed to Children's Church. You're going to go right out that south door there. Your teacher's going to teach you a story, a lesson out of God's Word. So love, love all the energy those kids bring. So, hey, speaking of the kids, if you've been around our church for any time at all, you know a rumor that we are building a building. However, you haven't seen much evidence of that yet. And so let me give you a, a quick update that's some good news. Go ahead and put up that picture, that first picture. This doesn't look like much, but this is a year and tens of thousands of dollars worth of effort. So uh, we are building a ministry center on the back of this building. It's going to provide place for about 100 students at a time. As God has granted growth to our church, we've seen a lot of that come through student ministry. And clearly, as you saw with the kids, we've seen a lot of kids in children's ministry. Those are growing areas of ministry. And so we're going to build an auditorium, or an auditorium, a building that will provide for 100 students at a time. We're going to provide a place that allows for our staff to be back on campus. Now, I've been off campus for five years, and then the rest of our staff for about four years. And they bring a tremendous amount of energy. We want to serve the needs of this congregation. We want to be back home here to do that. So there's going to be space for 15 uh, folks on staff here. And there's going to be a classroom for 30 adults, and so we want to be able to equip and train you for sharing your faith. So all of that is wrapped up in that pile of documents. This was our second submission to the county. We did this about a month ago. They gave us back the requirements. We have, uh, we hope, complied with that, and now the county has about uh, 20 business days to respond to that, and we're hoping and praying that they will generate for us then a permit I can't wait to have bulldozers on the property, right? That's a sign of progress. When we get permitting, we will have a dedication service. That'll be a great time, or a, or a groundbreaking service, I should say. Keep an eye on the bulletin for that. I want to take a moment right now and just pray over this process. Would you join me in prayer for this? Father, thank you for the growth in this congregation. Thank you, Father, for the lives that have been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the moms and dads who are rearing their children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Thank you for students, Father, who have been influenced by the ministry of this church to the local high schools and middle school. Father, I thank you for the men and women here who have been strengthened in their faith, who have found help in time of need, Lord, because of our staff, our pastors, our volunteers. And Lord, I pray as we move into this building phase of this project, that you would oversee that. Father, give us the favor of the county. We want to build a building that is safe and functional and complies with code. So, Lord, I pray that the work that architects and engineers have put in would be accepted. And then, Father, I pray that the county would move things along so that we can begin the construction phase. I thank you, Father, for the men and women who have generously given to make this possible. Lord, stir the hearts of others to be a part of this financially, Lord, to make this a light burden for us financially. Father, I pray that as a congregation, we would stay unified around our purpose to make, to baptize, and to teach followers of Jesus Christ. I pray this church would continue to build strong relationships to serve the community, and we would see commitments grow in this church. Father, I pray for those workers and subcontractors who will be on site in the coming months. Lord, would you keep them safe? And Father, give us the opportunity to share our faith with them. Lord, we pray that we won't wait until the building's done to see the gospel go forth in that building. Lord, we do it even during construction. So, Father, I pray in every way, go before us. May we continue to thank you for your goodness to this church in evidence in a building project. Thank you again. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Listen for updates, watch for them, and God willing, we'll have those for you in about another month. Well, uh, our last day off for me was exciting. It was one of those days, beautiful weather, sunny, cool. I was out on the back deck in the morning. Vicki and I were there. I was drinking coffee, reading. It's hard to beat that for a good start to your day. When I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, there is a little, just a little thin neck of forest preserve next to our house. And out of that forest preserve came one of our cats. It's the outdoor cat, Alistair. And uh, Alistair came trotting up towards our deck, 
and he had something dangling from his, mo- his mouth. I thought, oh, okay, well, he's a mouser, and so he got a mouse. And he, as cats do, he was very proud of that. And so he uh, trotted right up the steps, and our back door was open, and Vicky was standing there, and he walked right up to her very proudly, uh, dropped that. Now, I thought, that's really big for a mouse. And I realized in an instant that was not a mouse at all, nor was it dead. This was a chipmunk. And uh, when he dropped that chipmunk at my wife's feet, who was standing in our doorway, a few things happened all at once. First of all, the chipmunk took off into our house. <laughs> Secondly, Vicky said, ah! I can't even scream as loud as she or as high as she screamed. Third, our 90-pound Labrador retriever said, this has got to be fun, <laughs> and chased the cat and the chipmunk through our house. I was irritated because I still had a half a cup of coffee to go, and I had to get up off of my chair, and what ensued was a lot of fun for about three minutes where I and my wife and the dog, and we have two cats, two cats chased a little chipmunk around our first floor. And what happened was the chipmunk finally decided the safest place for him was going to be in our downstairs bathroom. Well, the problem is it's a very small half bath, and so the chipmunk and two cats and the dog and I went in there. And it's very crowded. You don't want that many people in your bathroom. And so the chipmunk ran out, and then the cats and the dog ran after them. And the chipmunk, I opened the back garage door like, go, fly to safety. And no, the dog ran out the back door. The chipmunk ran back into the bathroom. Finally, what I did, finally what I did, I went to the bathroom, big tough guy that I am, right? And I chased the chipmunk out, and I slammed the door. And the chipmunk ran along the edge of the door trying to get back in. Now, I opened the door, the back door, for him to get out, and, of course, the dog is there, right? That's not a good thing. The dog came barreling in. Finally, the chipmunk escaped onto the garage. And as far as we know, the chipmunk is safe and happy, and we have a great story to tell. Well, listen, some of you feel like the chipmunk. Here's what I mean. For some of you, you are feeling pressure right now. And for some of you, you are convinced that the way to relieve that pressure is to go through a certain door. That is, there's an opportunity, there's an activity, there's an attitude, or there's an action that you are pursuing saying, I want the pressure off me. I can feel the cat nipping at my tail, and the way to get the pressure off is to go through that door, and someone has slammed that door in your face. Some of you know the pressure of your faith in Jesus Christ has put you into conflict with a family member or someone at work. And the pressure you face is, I want to go through that door to find escape. I want to find relief. I think if I could get that way or that action or that attitude, I would find relief from the pressure, the pursuit that I feel. And yet God has closed that door. Or someone has closed the door in your face. And you say, if I would just back off a little bit in my faith, maybe that's the right thing. Let me give you the action the Word of God teaches us from Revelation chapter 3. It's where we'll be today, Revelation 3. When I feel like the door has slammed in my face, when I feel like the pressure is on and that 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 cat is nipping at my tail, and I want to get out of that, what should I do? When my faith has put me on a collision course with someone I care about, or on my job, or at my school, they've slammed the door, how do I handle that? Obedience is the way through your trial. You're facing the pressure. Somebody slammed a door in your face. Maybe it's relationally. Maybe it's a job opportunity. Maybe it's an educational opportunity. And what you want is to kick down the door and get in there. (laughs) Obedience is the way through your trial. Some of you are feeling the pressure right now. If I will compromise my faith, if I will set aside what Jesus thinks about this decision or this relationship 
or this job opportunity, <laughs> the pressure will be off. What I would say to you is that what God is calling us to is obedience. Even when we feel like the door has been shut, and that is our best opportunity. So from Revelation chapter 3, look at verse 7. We're in the sixth week of our series on the, the seven churches. The Lord Jesus himself composed letters to seven local churches, third generation believers uh, in the New Testament time. And the sixth of those seven letters went to a church called Philadelphia, or in the city of Philadelphia. Look at verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. The Lord is composing this. He's going to deliver a message to a church that was feeling the pressure. Now, let me tell you a couple things about Philadelphia. Philadelphia, and I don't mean Pennsylvania, Philadelphia in western Turkey was the smallest of the seven um, cities to whom the Lord wrote. It was the one about which we know the least. It was a, sort of an obscure city. The two things we know for sure about this city of Philadelphia, number one, it was prone to earthquake. Uh, one generation prior to this letter being delivered, the city itself had been devastated by an earthquake. The public buildings flattened, people killed, and living in such fears for a while, they lived in tents out in the surrounding plains. There was a fear of instability in the city of Philadelphia. The second thing we know about the city of Philadelphia is that it was a place that was a grape growing. It was wine country in the ancient world. You think of the Napa Valley, the Champagne region of France, and we think of Philadelphia in the ancient world. So, uh, instable because of uh, earthquakes, but the economic engine was often vineyards and winemaking, things like that. To this church, the Lord Jesus wrote a letter. He, here's the problem. The problem for the church in Philadelphia was one of rejection. That is, these folks, these believers, they're third-generation believers, many of them had grown up going to synagogue. They had a Jewish heritage. And when they trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, many of them were removed from the synagogue. In other words, the door to worship was slammed on them. They grew up there. It wasn't just where they went for Sabbath on Saturday. It was the place where they had their family, and they might have dinner together afterwards. It was the place where their business connections and relationships were. It was the place where contracts were made and they were signed. And all that was rejected when you put your faith in Christ and you're put out of the synagogue and the door is shut. That, that's going to have some impact on your relationships in the home. That's going to mean some of you aren't invited anymore to some of those family get-togethers. That's going to mean might be whispered about you, what was wrong with the way you were raised? Are you a religious nut or something? That was what was being said to these new believers. And the pressure they faced was when the door was shut, they wanted relief from the pressure, so should I compromise my faith? Should I make a decision that while it might offend Jesus, would relieve the pressure. Listen, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you right now are hanging by a thread. You have faced the pressure. Someone in relationship or a job opportunity has been closed to you because you have refused to sacrifice, you have refused to compromise your faith. <laughs> There's a word that the Lord gave to that church that is applicable for us today, and it is the word to live in obedience. To, to not give in to the pressure to try and open doors that have been shut. To trust that God is the one who can open doors that we think are not available to us. And that's precisely the message the Lord Jesus gives. Now, chapter 3, verse 7. Again, it's the sixth of the seven churches. And the, the format or the form of the letter is something like this. First, the Lord says something about himself. Then he says something about the church, and that's going to be something that we're going to recognize. And then he gives them three promises. I love that. And there's only one encouragement. There's only one command or imperative in there. So let's, let's walk through the text. And again, let me remind you, the way through our trial is obedience. The way to take the pressure off is not compromise. 
or even the denial of Jesus Christ. So here's the message the Lord sent to that early church. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, and here's something about Jesus. The words of the Holy One, the true one, very specific description that anyone who had a religious background of Judaism would understand reference God himself. Jesus is claiming no less than to say, I am the Holy One, the one written about all in the Old Testament. I am God, come here in a body. Breathtaking claim. You want to talk about the God of the Old Testament who created, who sustained, who delivered his people? It's me. I'm the Holy One. And then he says this, and I'm the true one, meaning I'm the genuine one. You you can count on me. When people shut the door in your face, when the very thing you hope would bring relief is slammed in your face, and you can't count on circumstances, and you can't count on job, and you can't count on uh, education or relationship, Jesus says, I'm God, I'm the Holy One, and I am true. I'm genuine. You can count on me. And then he says this, and I love it. Talk Talk about a message this church in Philadelphia needed to hear. Who has the key of David, meaning as much as David was the greatest king of Israel and has the right, the key to the throne, the authority, so I claim that authority. I have the key of David. Now look look at that next phrase. End of verse 7. Who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one opens. Listen to me, listen to me. You and I, so often in our life, we face the slam door, the disappointment, the rejection, and we say, I'm at a loss. What I want to do is bust down that door. Jesus Christ says, I am God. You can count on me, and I will open doors that no one can shut. And let me be very specific what he means by that in that verse. He is saying for some, certainly what the folks in Philadelphia faced, You think that because the synagogue door got slammed in your face, that God is not near. You think that somehow your relationship with God is dependent upon a synagogue or a church or a cathedral, and that option has been shut to you. Maybe the the religion you grew up with, you have changed that or you're you're questioning that. And people have said to you, we're going to slam the door on you. This is exactly what the church in Philadelphia faced. And here's what Jesus said. When I open the door to God, no one can shut that door. When I open the way of salvation, and that is what I've done, no one can shut you out. It's not about your church. It's not about your uh, synagogue. It's not about your cathedral. It's about the person of Jesus Christ who opens or shuts the way to God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I have opened the door. You may feel like you're slammed out of the synagogue. You're not shut from heaven. You're not shut from God. I've cast the door open wide. What's so interesting about that, look at verse 8. He's going to talk about what he knows about them. What's so interesting about Jesus saying, I opened the door, is those Jewish folk in Philadelphia should have recognized that. It had been a promise that God had made all throughout the Old Testament. So look at verse 8. Jesus says, I know your works. Stop, stop for a minute. Some of you, in the face of rejection, have stood strong. Some of you, when others have questioned your faith or challenged you to release your faith or you face temptation to turn away from your faith, you've stuck by the stuff. You need to hear what Jesus says to the churches. I know you. I know what you're facing. I love the commendation. I love the encouragement. We feel like we're going through it alone. Jesus said, I open the door and I know what you're facing. And he, he specifies two things. I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. We felt that, haven't we? I don't have the resources to get through this. Jesus, I know you have a little power. I understand the circumstances in which you find yourself, but look at what he says, two things. 
I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have walked in obedience. You've kept my word. And you've not denied my name. You have not acted. You have not spoken. You have not had attitudes. You have not had decisions that would say, Jesus who? <laughs> Denying Jesus' name is always a temptation for believers, right? You remember Peter? Remember Peter? Night Jesus was betrayed. He's on, Jesus is on trial, and Peter's kind of on trial too. He's standing around the fire, and someone says, hey, aren't you a follower of Jesus? I know you are. Ah, uh, Jesus who? Like, remind me? And a few minutes later, he's uh, standing by the fire, and someone else says, I, man, I know I've seen you with Jesus. You're a follower, right? Uh, no, no, really, you're mistaken. I, no, I'm not. And, and the third time, right? Yeah, I... I know. I can tell by your speech. You got an accent from the north. You're a follower of that Jesus from the north, right? And he calls down a curse and he says, I am not. Sometimes we're tempted to act out in ways that would deny Jesus Christ. Sometimes we feel the pressure because doors have been closed to us relationally or job or educationally or even in our, in our religious background. And the temptation is, you know what, if I'll just fudge a little bit, don't, don't, don't do that. I know you have little power, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. When the pressure's on, when the cat's nipping at your tail, when you're pry, uh, trying hard to open that door, that listen, in reality only leads to a dead end anyway. Stand firm. Don't quit. And as an encouragement, the Lord gives us three promises. When the door's been shut in our face, we want nothing more than to sort of push through that and find relief. Jesus says, you obey my word. You walk in obedience. That's going to be the pathway through your trial. And don't deny my name. But don't do, act out, say things that would make people say, huh, I thought that was a Christian. Here, here are the promises. There are three. The first one, of verse 9, I, I will give you respect. That's the promise. Oh. Verse 9, behold, that is, pay attention to what I'm about to say. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. When we're faithful in the face of a slammed door and we don't cut corners and we don't disobey God's word and we don't deny the Savior who purchased us, God says, I'll bring you respect. Now, there's a lot in that verse. Let me unpack it just a little bit. Those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews who are not should not be nor should it ever be an excuse to be anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. What he's saying is that behind some of this rejection that you and I are feeling, there is some satanic power, demonic power. I'm not saying that other faiths or other religions are demonic. Don't get that. What I'm saying is Satan will use anything he can to discourage the believer. And in this case, the door had been shut in their face, and they were feeling the pressure to compromise. And the Lord said, listen, those who have rejected you, those who've slammed the door in your face, are the very ones who one day will acknowledge that I have loved you. It's not about revenge, it's about respect. What's he mean by that? That they'll come and they'll bow down and they acknowledge that I've loved you. What he's saying is this. They should have understood that when Jesus Christ came and said, I'm going to throw open the doors of heaven to everyone, not just Jewish people, they should have seen that as a fulfillment of God's promises. Don't turn there, but can I read to you one of the things the Lord said he would do when he sent the Savior, that the Savior would throw open the doors to those who are not Jewish? Listen, if you're here and you're not Jewish, this verse is for you. Listen to Isaiah 56. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. We shouldn't feel like if we don't have the right ethnicity or the right religious background, that disqualifies us with faith in, uh, for faith in God. Thus says the Lord, 
I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Those who are far away, those who before would not even have thought about going into this relationship with God are going to be brought near. And listen, verse 6, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, that's us. Formerly, we were far away. Formerly, we didn't have the right background. But in the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus who says, opens the door, he's thrown the door wide open to all people for faith in God. These I will bring to my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. It speaks of those who are far away being brought near to be able to pray to the God who saves them, to find joy in their times of worship. They will be joyful in my house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Remember when Jesus himself quoted that? This is what God is doing, taking those who are far away and bringing them near. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to him besides those already gathered. That's a promise from the word of God. Those who are far away will be brought near. And those New Testament church people were feeling the pressure from others who didn't get that truth. When you stand firm, when you refuse to compromise on obedience or deny the name of Jesus Christ, Ultimately, that will bring you respect. The Lord said, one day, one day, those who, those who think that they've slammed the door of heaven in your face will recognize God has loved you. Second, verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance. Isn't it interesting that what the word the Lord Jesus gives to us is to patiently endure? We think we've got to go do something, do something, do something. Maybe God has you where you are right now in a place of pressure and discomfort because he wants you to be still for a while. And what do we do? We patiently endure that. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, now listen, here's the promise. Not just respect, I will bring you relief. I will bring you relief. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. There is coming a time of great pressure, a time of great trouble. There is a great time of tribulation coming. It's written out in the Word of God in chapter, the rest of uh, Revelation, chapters 7 and 8. And the Lord says, not only will I bring respect to you, I will bring relief to you. You are not going to suffer like the world suffers. You are not going to go through a time of judgment in your life like those who without Christ will go through a time of judgment in their lives. You've kept my word. I will keep you from judgment. I will bring relief to you when you are patient, when you obey, when you don't deny in time respect of others and relief from suffering. Listen, that little chipmunk didn't find relief by bolting into the downstairs bathroom another time. He found relief when I opened another door and he bolted out to freedom. Don't, don't compromise. Don't deny. Don't think the door that someone shut in your face is the only option you have. Patient endurance, and the Lord says, and I'll bring you relief. Look at the third promise in verse 12. The one who conquers... Can I just tell you how much I love that believers who are under the gun or feeling like the door is slammed in their face, God sees us as conquerors? The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Wow, a lot going on. What's that all about? <laughs> Well, remember I said that Philadelphia was a place prone to earthquakes and there was a lot of insecurity and instability there. And so he's making an analogy saying, listen, you want to find stability in your world? Don't go running from door to door to door thinking if I can just get this where I only had that. You stand firm and I'll make you like a pillar, like a solid rock. 
That's interesting in the church of Philadelphia, based on what happened after that. That church in Philadelphia stood firm for 1,200 years. But around the turn of the century, 1,300, the church was overrun by the Turkish Empire, and it was destroyed. If you go to the city that used to be called Philadelphia, I was are today, if you go to the city of Philadelphia today, here's what you might see. The only thing that remains of the church in Philadelphia, the building, are two pillars. Jesus is saying, listen, child of God, I'm not going to make you like big bricks of stone. I'm going to make you a living pillar. I will promise you reward your life is not going to be more stable by you trying every single door that's been closed in your face or finding the new opportunity. Your, face, uh, your life is going to be stable when you stand firm in your faith, when you don't deny my word. And then he says, and I'm going to put my name on you. What's he mean by that? It's the idea of identity. So, so for example, you see this. This was a gift to me a, a few years ago. Uh, we're feeling good about the Bulls? Yeah, not really, <laughs> right? I am feeling good about the Bulls. I think the Bulls are going to come back, right? All right, and so um, this jersey, to whom does it belong? It belongs to the Bulls. How do you know? Because it's got the name on there. It's an identifier. You put the name on here, and whoever's wearing this, he belongs to the Bulls. He has loyalty to the Bulls, right? The Lord says, listen, you hold fast in times of trouble. You don't give up when the door gets slammed in your face. You continue to be uh, living in obedience. You don't deny my name, and I'm going to put my name on you. You belong to me. And then how about this? This is Heinrich. Remember him? He was a good bull. <laughs> There's a very personal identification. This is not just a jersey of the bulls. This is a bull's jersey for Kirk Heinrich. We know who he is. We know he belongs to the bulls. And when you and I stand firm in our faith, Jesus Christ says, I'm going to bring you reward. There's stability like a pillar that stands firm in the face of earthquakes and uh, overcoming those who would attack you. And there's a personal acknowledgement. This one belongs to me. Now, we skip verse 11, look at it. It's the only imperative, the only encouragement, the only to-do in this entire letter to the church at Philadelphia. I'm coming soon. Okay, relief is on its way. The two words. Hold fast. Grip. Don't, don't, don't compromise. Hold fast to what you already have. Remember, Jesus Christ has said, I will throw open the doors. You have access to God the Father. You need not fear. You don't worry about kicking down other doors. And don't fear when other people slam the door in your face. You hold on to what you've got. And when you do that, I will bring you respect, and I will bring you relief, and I will bring you reward. Look at verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says to the churches, listen, pay attention. So let me just wrap up with three pieces of counsel, I believe, comes out of God's Word here to help you when you're facing the slammed door. I'm talking about rejection. Someone or something you love has been taken from you. An opportunity you thought you had seems like it's been closed off to you. You feel the cat's nip at your tail. What do you do? I'm going to remind you what this letter was all about. Obedience is the way through our trial. Obey. It's the way to get through the trial. Don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get out of it. You just walk in obedience while you're in it. Second, obey. God will open doors we cannot open ourselves. We, we get fixated on the doors. But, but my plan was this. My plan was that. I hoped that this and that door got slammed. <laughs> Sometimes by those who oppose. Don't worry about the door. Worry about God. 
He has the ability to open doors that no one can shut or to shut the doors and nobody's going to open it. Hold fast. Be faithful. God will open the doors you cannot open. Third, obey because God offers rewards now and forever. God offers rewards now. I will bring you respect. I will bring you relief. And forever, I will bring you reward. From the perspective of a million years from now, the slam door in our face will mean nothing. It was um, December 1st, 1955. It was 6 o'clock at night. It was beginning to get dark. It was Birmingham, Alabama. One of the city buses rumbled down the main street, stopped, and led on four passengers. They sat in the fourth row, right side. The bus rumbled on a little further and picked up a whole bunch of passengers from a company that had just let out. The bus driver, a man named Jeff Blake, got up, turned around to the four that had got on to the previous stop and said, you need to get up and go to the back of the bus. We need seats for these white people that just got on. Those four blacks, three stood up and walked to the back. That was traditionally what had happened in the South in those days. But one lady stood still. In fact, she slid over to a seat right by the window. And she said, I'm not moving. And the bus driver, Jeff Blake, said, if you don't move, I will call the police on you. And she said, then call the police on me. And he did, and the police arrived that December 1st, 1955, and arrested Rosa Parks. Hauled her off to the police station, fingerprinted her, took her mugshot. She was arrested for standing firm. That's been almost 65 years ago. Likely none of you knew the name Jeff Blake, the driver who called the police on her. We all know the name of Rosa Parks, pioneer of the civil rights movement, hero of those who would stand for their rights and not give in and compromise. And how about this? Talk about a pillar in the house of our God. Rosa Parks, one of only two women to have a statue in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. It took a lot of years, but she got a reward. She had relief. She's been honored. I want to challenge you not to give in. Don't don't take the slam door as a personal insult. Take it as the God of heaven saying to you, I've got something better for you, and I'm going to open a door nobody's going to shut. Do not quit. Hold fast your faith. Do not deny the Savior who bought you. Stand fast. Let me pray for you. Father, today I pray for some who right now are feeling that pressure to bolt. They may have had a really tough few weeks or months. Opportunities they thought they held right in their hand, those doors have been slammed in their face. Some are facing the pain of a relationship that because their spouse or their child or their parent doesn't share their faith, those doors have been slammed and it can hurt. Father, some on their job are being asked to compromise, to deceive, to cut corners. And if their faith in Jesus Christ prevails, it may cost them the promotion or the door to growth. Lord, give us the courage to stand firm, to hold fast, not to deny the name of Jesus Christ who died and rose for us, Father, I pray for strength to endure. And Father, I pray for some who may have failed. 
God, they're living in the backwash of foolish or sinful choices. Father, I pray they would run to you because you open doors. You rewrite futures. You bring forgiveness and freedom. Father, I pray for any that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord. They would believe that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. He rose again and offers eternal life, an open door to all who believe in that. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who loves us and lives for us. I ask this in his name. And all God's people agreed by saying, amen. If I did the math right between me our 90-pound Labrador Retriever, my wife and two cats, that's about 400 pounds to a half a pound. And yet the chipmunk survived. Don't you be intimidated by shut doors. Your God says, I'll open the doors, and nobody's going to slam it. Let's stand and close our service by singing about the cornerstone, the solid rock of Jesus Christ, our Savior.